God's Word. Take your Bible, not your iPhone or your iPad, but your Bible. Not your electronic device, but the Word of God. Pages, words on it, words in English, inspired by God the Holy Spirit, translated accurately and preserved. Chapter 3. Tonight we will be examining Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is the single premier passage on marriage. There is no chapter in the entire Bible more important for a healthy and happy marriage than Ephesians 5. Whatever you're going to do, DVR it, postpone it. If you're a married couple, come back tonight and be taught from the Apostle Paul through the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit how to have a happy marriage. Because it's in that chapter. Everything that you need for a happy marriage is found in Ephesians 5. Let's begin reading in verse 13. Chapter 3, First Peter. Who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But if you suffer for righteousness, righteousness' sake, happy are you, blessed are you. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear, having a good conscience. And if I mispronounce it, so be it. You know what we're talking about. That's Whereas they may speak, they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or conduct or manner of life or deportment or behavior in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. Why? For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, bless this time together, I pray. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see and come and make this hour different than any other hour of the week. And now I pray in particular, Lord, for our married couples and those that are engaged and those that are in courtships and those that hope that God would bring them a husband or bring them a spouse, that they would make it a priority to return tonight to receive the instruction that Paul has for husbands and wives. I pray, God, that that which Satan would do to interfere and, 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 and prohibit obstacles, I pray that they would be bound in the pit of hell and that we would be faithful to the preaching of your word tonight at 6 o'clock. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our focus today will not be on verse 18. In case there's someone here that will be absent next week, I want you to focus right now in particular at that verse with me. I want you to see what a single encompassing verse it is for the gospel. 
I want you to write down the word gospel next to verse 18. I want you to take your pen and circle the number 18 there and write the word gospel. I want you to see how Peter summarizes that Christ also has once suffered for our sins. What an amazing idea that God's own son, Jesus the Christ, was willing to suffer for my sins. Peter says, the just for the unjust. That's me. I'm the unjust. He's the just. The just one suffered for the unjust. What what a concept. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the just one, to suffer for all of us who are unjust. That, That he might bring us to God. What a description that the Jesus Christ is carrying you to the presence of God, that you're utterly alienated from God, that you can't come to God, that you're not invited to the throne outside of Christ, that there isn't another way there, that if you're going to get to God, He is the one that brings you there. Being put to death in the flesh, his death, his burial. And then notice how Peter makes particular reference to his resurrection by the quickening. Quickening is made alive. So in this single verse, and, and, and we'll unpack it next week, but in this single verse, we see suffering for sins, being alienated from God, and thus a necessity being brought to God. We see Jesus Christ doing that. We see the just or the unjust. We see his death and his resurrection in one verse. It's everything you need. It's everything you need to show someone how to be saved. It's there. All that must be done at that point is to believe that truth, to believe it. Now let's go back to verse number 13. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Verse 14. If you suffer for righteousness, doing the right thing, that, that, that is making a conscious effort to do what is right. If you suffer for that, you're blessed. So in verse 13, particular reference to doing what is good. In verse number 14, doing what is right. In verse number 15, set the Lord God aside in your heart. Exalt him as worthy. Make him king of your heart. Submit yourself to his lordship in your heart. Then... Be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. And we looked at that last week, and and truly that's the focus of the verse. That's the big picture of the verse. I did not get to with meekness and in fear last week. We didn't get there. I didn't get to having a good conscience. So now that's what I want my focus to be. But I don't want anyone to lose sight that that's the big picture, giving an answer for the hope. Where's the clicker at? There it is. Let me get it. Next slide, Art. Thanks, Jacob. So we said last week, what are the, what's the reason for the hope? Maybe you weren't here last week. What's the reason for the hope? I gave you four things, four solid things. I want to tell you about a God in heaven. You need some hope? I do. I do. Do you watch the news like I do? Do you know what's going on in the world? Do you see ISIS in Iraq encompassing around Christians, starving them to death? ISIS in Iraq is murdering Christians. Do, do, you, do you wonder what's the future going to be like? Do you wonder what's going to happen? I do. I need to know that there's a God in heaven in charge. I need to know that there's someone there that I can go to. I need to know that there is a Savior that has delivered me from my sin. I need to know that there's a spirit residing inside me that's proof positive that there is a God. And finally, as we sang this morning, John, and I just could not get over that you gave us such a good song this morning, I've got to know that there's something beyond here. That there is coming a kingdom. That there is a place where Christ will rule utterly supreme and every demon and Satan himself will be bound eternally and death will be defeated and sin will reign no more. 
And so we gave you last week four things. The God of the Bible, the God who's involved in the affairs of man, the God who's loving, kind, compassionate, merciful, the God who's just and honest and upright, the God who's omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent all at the same time, the God who's responsive to your prayers and hears your very words, the God who's working to a predetermined end. Our Savior that we read about in verse number 18 who died for our sins. The Holy Spirit that dwells inside you. Greater is he that is in the world that's in you than he that is in the world. This amazing hope that the Spirit lives inside me. And then finally, number four, eternal life to all who will believe. That we said Mrs. Holder, Mrs. Ruth Holder uh, is not simply dying. That she's going to be with her Lord. That absent from the body is present with the Lord that the ultimate and complete rule of God is going to occur in the future. Death will be eradicated and there'll be no more sin. And so now let's go into our text this morning. Not only is Peter concerned that we can give an answer, he's concerned about the way we give the answer. Did you see that? He says, with meekness and in fear. Do you see it? It's not enough just to give an answer. How do you give the answer? How do you relate to that person? With meekness, with meekness, with humility. Arrogance kills Christianity. Arrogance kills it. We don't need any more arrogant Christians. We need humble, compassionate, gentle, kind, tender Christians. We need Christians who don't approach things with a spirit of arrogancy. Instead, they are humble when they give their answers. They are patient with the person they're engaging. They are gentle and tender with them. They don't just abruptly give them the answer. No, Peter says, you give that answer with humility. You give that answer with meekness. What would propel me to do such a thing? What would project me to do such a thing? The realization that if I understand this truth, it's because God opened my eyes. That God opened my eyes. That this isn't something that I discovered from an intellectual perspective. No, this is something that I am unbelievably blessed to understand because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it is now my joy... My joy to get to share this truth with you in a humble, gentle, compassionate, meek, tender way. See the difference? It's critical. Folks, if we're not careful, we're going to get nasty on Facebook. Rough, harsh, witty, abrupt. There's a pastor in, uh, in northwest uh, uh, United States that they're calling for his resignation because on Facebook and these discussion boards, he would use profanity to make his point to, as in this arguing, you know? That's not us. We're careful. We're gentle. We're kind. Every word is measured. Our goal is to engage in a very meek way. And then what does he mean by fear? Because if you have an ESV in your lap, and it may say respect. So I'm wondering, what, what's the right answer here? Is it fear or is it respect? Is, is Peter talking about fear of that unbeliever? Or is Peter talking about a fear of God? Because clearly one set of translators with the word respect has decided that it's gentle and respect. And then I, I wonder why we have fear being rendered here. So I go to the Greek and I get no help. None. No help. It's fear. It's fear. So what's happening here is somebody's doing some interpretation as they're translating and deciding that the context is respect the person. Well, I would clearly agree with respect the person, but that doesn't answer the question. I wonder what Peter's referring to here. Is he saying that I should be giving my answer with meekness and in fear of God? Or is he saying that I should respect the person? Because I know for a fact it doesn't mean to fear the person because he told me in the previous verse that I'm not to fear them. So I got that piece. It's not that. So I'm thinking that it's a fear of God. But wait a minute. Does that mean it's wrong to respect? Of course not. In fact, I would submit to you that a very fear of God will compel me to respect the person. It'll compel me to. Because if I fear God, if I fear God, I'm going to treat you better, Gene. 
A fear of God will pro project me. It'll compel me. It'll obligate me to treat you better. It does. There's no other way around it. I fear God, so therefore I do or don't do some things. A healthy reverence for God is a good thing. So the ESV says gentleness and respect, and I would say yes, respect the person, but never lose sight of the fear of God you should have. Now, notice verse 16. Having a good conscience. Did I get it right that time? Because, no? I'm just going to hand you the mic every time, Dave, and you can pronounce it correctly. I'm not talking about awareness like he's conscious and he can talk. I'm talking about that thing inside of you. That's what I want to talk about. What is it? Let me define it. It's a sense or consciousness of moral goodness or blameworthiness of one's own conduct, intentions, character together with a feeling of obligation to do right or be good. That's one definition. Let me give you another one. It's the inner sense of what's right or wrong. I want to unpack this this morning because I think this is an amazing gift from God. That God gives you inside of you a, a regulator, a moral compass, that which can guide you to do the right thing. That God has built that in you. I'm afraid that we're getting too much to where we ignore it. That it speaks to us and we just move on. And I want to show you this morning, from Peter's perspective, we need to make sure we're listening to it. That we work hard at having a good conscience before God. That we know that the inner voice speaking to us about what's right and wrong, it, we're answering that with what's right. We're doing what's right. And I want to poke some fun at Darwinism for a minute. I want to ask the question, how would a Darwinian scientist explain the existence of this thing? I think it's a reasonable question. If over... Billions of years, we have evolved. I want to know, when did this thing happen? I think it's a reasonable question. Because, because I understand from a biblical perspective that God created Adam and gave to Adam this inner sense of what's right and wrong. I understand that from a biblical perspective, that Adam knew right from wrong. And that, in fact, when they sinned, he was aware of their nakedness. Right. His inner voice told him that. But if you, for whatever reason, say, that's not me. I don't believe in that creation nonsense. I think for sure that the scientists are right and we've evolved over 1.2 trillion years. I want to know, where'd that thing come from? Right, and that's a great question, John. Let's follow that up. Why was it necessary? Because here, listen to this now. I think this is a legitimate argument I'd like to have with you this morning. This very inner sense of right and wrong actually is opposite of the survival of the fittest. That's right. That's right. Because the survival of the fittest says, I would never share. That's right. I would never share. I take what's mine. That's right. right. Now, but yet I know inside of me that if I'm starving and David's starving and we stumble upon something and I start eating all of it and I don't share, I'll get convicted inside of me. I'll be made aware of, of what a wretched person I am for not sharing. But from a Darwinian perspective, I should not have that feeling. That's right. I should never have anything that compels me to that. I should be, I need all of this. Sorry. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think it's a legitimate argument. I think it's one that the scientists have not explained to us. I think that in your ninth grade biology class at, at Cumberland County School, you ought to bring it up. You ought to be willing to go toe to toe and say, I'd like to have an answer from where this thing came from because it doesn't make sense to develop this. In fact, it would be just the opposite. It should be suppressed to the point at which it no longer exists. And we'll get there in just a second. David said, and it's everywhere. In other words, all human beings have this. And oh, by the way, they all have that moral code written on their heart. And we'll get there. 
How big of a deal is this? It's so big of a deal that in Santa Fe, New Mexico, they met for five, four days to talk about this. That scientists understand this is a problem, that they do not have an answer for this thing. Now, the creationist has an answer. We have an answer. If you're looking for an answer, it's God. It is God who put this in there. Who God said, he said, these are animals and they are wonderful. That's your cat. That's your dog. Those are cute monkeys. That's a panda bear. Those are wonderful. But these are human beings made in my image. They're different. And one of the ways they're different is I have given them an inner voice that senses what is right from wrong. Now that inner voice that was given from God to Adam and Eve was perfect prior to the fall. Perfect. Unbelievably perfect. Always led them to the right thing. Never convinced them that what was right was wrong, wrong was right. Never played tricks on them. It was only until it was marred by the fall. Then, oh, by the way, we would argue that upon salvation, the Holy Spirit comes in and makes up for that fall by the indwelling of the Spirit speaking to you about what's right. So number three, would you please notice the linkage that Peter makes between this keeping a good or clear conscience with good conduct. He's saying that there's a relationship here. That good conduct helps me have a good conscience before God. That I'm, I'm clear of, of my inner voice. I know I'm working hard at doing the right thing. That's why I wanted you to see how much Peter is concerned about doing what is good in verse 13 and doing what is right in verse 14 and doing it with meekness and fear in verse 15 and having a clear conscience or a good conscience in verse 16 by doing what is good in Christ in verse 16. This is your manner of life. This is your conduct. It matters to God. The way you carry yourself when you leave this church is important. It matters. Albert Einstein said, never do anything against conscience even if the state demands it. This is an important thing. Think about Nazi Germany. The state demanded that Jews be exterminated. How did somebody do that? How did those German guards do that? How did they put Jews on boxcars and send them on their way? How did they flip switches? How, how, how is ISIS over in Iraq, how are they getting thousands of Muslim extremists to murder innocent people? How is that happening? Because every one of those Muslims was created with an inner voice that tells them this is wrong. And yet an allegiance to a cause a state, a nation, an ideal is, is demanding that they suppress that inner voice and obey that state. The Holman Christian Standard says, keep a clear conscience. Peter obviously believes that the Christian's conscience will be informed by the Holy Spirit such that to have a clear or good conscience before God is to live in obedience to the will of the Lord as revealed moment by moment, day by day. Church, this is real practical this morning. This is very practical. This is talking about that moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, listening to the inner voice. This is you leaving the parking lot, going out on the road, driving down the road, and now feeling the inner pressure, I was so rude. So much so that you turn the car around, Gray, and you go back to the parking lot, you get out of the car, and you go find the person because you got to have a clear conscience. And the only way you're going to get a clear conscience if you say, I'm sorry for being so rude to you. And you know what happens at that moment? That's right. You move into a clear conscience. Am I by myself or can anybody else this morning, can anybody else relate it all what I'm talking about? This is real, real pragmatic this morning. This is not pie in the sky theology. 
This is not for the unbelievers. They sure, I hope they're listening to him. Elbowing your husband. Hope he's listening. This is like for all of us. This is learning, learning to listen to the Holy Spirit speaking to us through that inner voice about what is right and wrong. How important is this? This is critically important. Hey, hey, church, a Christian does not lay in bed with someone they're unmarried to and not have a guilty conscience. It doesn't happen. There's no way. You're not telling me for a moment that the Lord, he understands that we're not married and we just kind of sleep together. No. You know. You, you go to sleep with that guilty conscience. You wake up with that guilty conscience. There's not a single man in this church who is married and who is a follower of Christ who can text with another female hiddenly and they don't have a guilty conscience. Doesn't happen. What happens is we don't care about having a clear conscience. We just ignore it. And that's troublesome. That's very troublesome. Because the longer you ignore it, the more difficult it becomes to hear it. Next slide. Paul said, I love this. Paul was able to stand up in front of him and said, Men and brethren, I have lived all my life until this day with a clear conscience before God. Is Paul saying that he was perfect? No. What he was saying is when the Lord convicted me of something, I dealt with it. When I was convicted of my fact that I was rude, that I was inconsiderate, that I stole, that I didn't give back money, that I wasn't compassionate, you pick whatever it is. The Lord dealt with me, I responded. It doesn't mean that you were without sin. It doesn't mean you weren't rude. It doesn't mean you weren't selfish. It means that when you engaged with it and you knew that I, I was wrong, you stopped what you were doing and got it right. Next slide. So the conscious establishes accountability. That conscious establishes accountability because the moral parameters of the law are written on all humans' hearts. All. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 2, verse 15. They show the works of the law written in their hearts. Now think about that. Because we are often asked, because we believe in the exclusivity of Christ, what about that person there, there, or there that's never heard the Mosaic Law, that doesn't know about the Ten Commandments, who hasn't heard the Sermon on the Mount? And Paul says it was written on their heart. It was written on their heart. That they have within them a mechanism that tells them, this is wrong, this is wrong. That they, they may not know English. They may have never read the Torah. They may have never heard a single of the Ten Commandments, but written on their hearts is an awareness of what is right and what is wrong. And you know what that brings? Accountability. Because if you know what is right, and there's an inside you, an inner voice saying, do what's right, do what's right, do what's right, and you ignore that, you're now accountable. So Paul is making this amazing connection between the heart and the conscious. And he's saying that God has written on this inner side of you a voice that tells you the right thing to do. It's either doing what or what? Accusing or excusing? Accusing or excusing? In my office, I've had men try to justify their adulterous relationship because God wants them to be happy. You know what that is? Excusing. Excusing. They, they have figured out a way to mentally rationalize this through. That their conscience has convinced them that this is okay. That they've come up with a justification for why it's okay. That's inside. They've had a battle inside. They've had that inner voice going, da 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 da, da, da back and forth, and they have worked through it. That is proof positive that there's a God. 
Paul says their thoughts either accuse or excuse certain behavior. The conscience creates thoughts that can guide each person in doing what is morally right. The law informs the conscience and differs from person to person. What do you mean differs from person to person? Can I give you an example? 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. That's the chapter where Paul talks about meat being offered to idols. Do you all remember that? That in that day in Corinth, that city of Corinth, they had idols. you remember that? And they would offer a chunk of beef to that idol, a, a chunk of beef. You know, here it is right here. I'm a T-bone, 16 ounces, outback kind of style. Throw that thing on the grill. And there's not one idol that ever ate the meat. Never ate it. Never ate it. So afterwards, it could be sold. And it could be sold at a cheap way. I mean, a discount price. Like, you can get yourself a steak cheap. Now, some people, some Christians, were able to say, there ain't no idols, there ain't no one offered anything, and I'm going to save myself a buck fifty a pound, serve it up to me. And they could eat it. And it didn't bother them one bit. Didn't bother them. There were others, they would say, I would never, never want to even touch something that was offered to an idol. I'll pay the higher price. To each one, their conscience guided what they believed was right in that situation. And oh, by the way, may I say to you that Paul said that we're to respect the one that has the weaker conscience. Not to mock them. Respect the difference. That we're not to, we're not to change their mind. We're not to argue with them. That if they have a, a standard that they believe is higher, and that's the direction that they want to live to, and that's how the conscience is speaking to them, then Paul, then Paul says, you do not offend that weaker brother. Right. Next slide. Paul says in Romans chapter number one, uh, 9, verse 1, that the Holy Spirit actually works through your conscience, that inside of the believer is the Holy Spirit speaking to you through that conscience. Paul's conscience, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, assured him that he was speaking the truth. The conscience of those outside of Christ, while faulty, is nevertheless their best guide for conduct. But the believer, the believer has the privilege of having this thing informed by the Holy Spirit, leading and guiding and directing. The conscience can help me figure out what the loving thing to do is at the given time. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience. And then, very troubling, he talks about a conscience that can be seared. Look at this description. He says they've had their conscience seared by a hot iron. Now think about that illustration that he's using there. Think about yeah, a hand that is very sensitive to touch. Very sensitive to touch because of nerve endings, right? Nerve endings on there. You can feel something. But if those hand was cauterized, if the nerve endings were cauterized, then it could no longer feel something there. Paul is saying that there are some people who no longer feel. They're conscious has been seared by a hot iron. Florence, these are the people that can line people up and murder innocent civilians. Their conscience has been seared by a hot iron. Does that happen overnight? No. no way. That happens over a prolonged period of time, brother, of ignoring what's right, ignoring what's right, ignoring what's right, ignoring what's right. That's why I wanted to talk about this this morning, Barry, because I wanted to remind the church that we need to listen to this inner voice, that we need to listen to the conscious when it tells us to do right, that there are some who have gone so far, Doug, that they no longer have any feelings. In fact, that's the way Paul describes it. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. He says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should therefore walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings. What a description. Past feelings? Could you go back to the picture now, Art? We were talking about ISIS and we were talking about Iraq, but this is Wyoming. This is a couple who has been housing their seven-year-old in a cage outside for three weeks. 
Three weeks. Three weeks. Now listen to me. The neighbors knew it was going on, but out of fear of the reprise from these folks, they said or did nothing. Folks, this is not Iraq, not Syria, not North Africa. This is Wyoming. It's one of the 50 states. These are folks who went into town every day and bought groceries and people would say good morning to them and they were kind and compassionate. But somehow, in one respect, their conscience was absolutely seared. Who could put a seven-year-old boy in a cage and leave him there for three weeks? He ate his meals in the cage, defecated in the cage, like a dog, folks. In fact, what made the article so ironic is that the pet was inside the house and the child was in the cage. You know what that is? That's a conscience seared by a hot iron. That's a living example of what I'm talking about. That doesn't happen just like that. You don't go from... Tuesday taking care of your child to Wednesday putting him in a cage. That happens over an extended period of time of ignoring, 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 ignoring to the point at which you're no longer feeling anything. It doesn't happen overnight. Ignoring it and ignoring it and ignoring it. Some of the atrocities that our soldiers have done in Afghanistan is an utter embarrassment to our nation and clear indication that there are soldiers that are suffering from a conscience that may be seared. Now let me explain to you why this is so troubling. Because it is in their hearts they are pricked of their need for a Savior. So a person whose conscience has been seared is never going to come to Christ. What do you mean? Acts chapter 2. They were pricked in their hearts and said, what must we do to be saved? When your heart gets beyond feeling, when your heart gets to the point where it's seared and you no longer can sense right and wrong, why would you ever need a Savior? Next slide. Go back to where we were, Art, one more time. Peter continues to provide encouragement for holy living. That's what he's doing here. He wants us living holy lives. He wants the false accusers to be put to shame at the day of judgment. He said earlier that some are going to glorify God in that day of visitation. And then others, in this case, they're they looking for ways to mock Christians. They're looking for opportunities to make us, uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, spit in our faces and to, to mock us and to make fun of us. And Peter says, live with a good conscience so that these will be put to shame, that they'll be ashamed on that day of judgment, that they'll know that they were wrong in the accusations that they made against Christians. And then finally, verse 17, and we're done. Peter throws out this sentence and we say, that's so, that's just, of course. He says in verse 17, it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And it seems like such a matter-of-fact statement that we just run right over it. But I want to unpack it for just a minute, and then we'll be done. In both cases, it's the will of God to suffer. Look at how it's worded. It is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. So in both cases, he's saying you're suffering because of the will of God. Now, wait a minute, then. What's the difference? He says, this one is blessed this one is not. What do you mean? What, what are you talking about here? All right, let's create a scenario and then we'll be done. Could a Christian murder someone? Yes? yes. Everyone says yes? Okay, great. And I agree with you. That person is born again and well equipped with firearms and all the necessities could come home find someone in bed with his wife and say, I'm going to put an end to this and just kill him. 
out of a fit of rage. And his, it doesn't mean he wasn't a Christian. It means at that moment he lost utter control of himself and he killed someone. Okay? Now, that person is now going to have to suffer. And it will be the will of God that they suffer. Whether that be execution or whether that be a lifetime in prison. God has established the laws of the land that you suffer for your sin. Yes. Right? So it'll be God's will. The will of God would be that you cannot go around murdering people and not suffer. Now, you're not going to be blessed in that suffering. You're going to prison and you're not going to be blessed. You're not going to get eternal reward for that suffering for 25 years in prison. You will still go to heaven because you were born again. And are your sins forgiven? Yes. And so you inherit eternal life at the end of that suffering. Peter said, that's not how you want to suffer. How then do we want to suffer? You want to suffer because you were doing the right thing. The right thing. Now that kind of suffering results in a reward. That kind of suffering. For example, the Christian in Mosul who would not recant. You know that's happening right now. The ISIS, Islamic um, states of Assyria, I mean Iraq and Syria, right? That's ISIS, I-S-I-S, -S, is demanding right now that Christians recant or they're being executed. Right now. It's not pie in the sky, folks. This is our world in the year 2014. Right now. Now, you've got two choices, recant or suffer. And it, die, right. They're going to suffer. But that's for doing the right thing. And it may be the will of the Lord. What do you mean it may be the will of the Lord? Look at Jim Elliot. Jim Elliot, that missionary who died for the cause of Christ. It was the will of the Lord. That didn't happen outside of the will of the Lord. It wasn't like God was asleep at the switch when that happened. And if God had been on the island, nothing would have happened. That was the will of the Lord. And from that amazing suffering for the cause of Christ, out of Wheaton College, thousands upon thousands became missionaries. Unbelievable number of students were compelled and motivated to go on the mission field from the Nick Saint, Jim Elliott, and the crew giving their lives up. So sometimes it is the will of the Lord that you suffer, even for doing the right thing. Peter says, make sure that your suffering is for the right thing. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning to understand this text and the significance of it in Jesus' name.